Let him go, or I will cut your wife's throat. I'll find another. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the absolutely best moments in scripted television history. Sorry, reality TV and sketch comedy fans, they'll be sitting this one out. This list was hard enough to rank as it is. I am 35 years old, I am divorced, and I live in a van down by the river. <laughs> Number 100, I've Been to Earth. Battlestar Galactica. This is not a drill. All Viper pilots report to Vipers immediately. Inbound Cylon fleet. We never thought we'd be so happy to see a sci-fi show return to Earth. But in just one sentence, Starbuck officially changed everything we thought we knew about the future of Battlestar Galactica. She dropped it so casually, too. She hasn't just been to Earth. She knows how to find it and wants to take everyone there. Like, now. I've been to Earth. I know where it is. Starbucks bombshell reveal set Battlestar Galactica on a fresh new direction at warp speed. Paired with a swelling score, strong direction, and a powerhouse performance from Katie Sackhoff, and you're left with a scene that shoots for the stars in every single way. And I'm gonna take us there. Number 99, Janet's Failsafe, The Good Place. I should warn you, I am programmed with a failsafe measure. As you approach the kill switch, I will begin to beg for my life. On paper, shutting down humanity's friendly assistant should be as easy as pressing the big red button. The issue? She has kids and they're relying on her. Just kidding. Janet is programmed to beg for her life anytime someone comes near her off switch. And as Chidi and Eleanor learn firsthand, she's very convincing. Look at Tyler. Tyler has asthma, but he is battling it like a champ. Look at him. No, Eleanor, look at them. As Janet constantly reminds them, though, she doesn't actually feel pain or fear. It's all just one hilarious act. But this is still the good place, and no great scene would be complete without Jason Mendoza entering the fray to, well, Jason it up. Who knew murdering a robot could be so funny? Oh, look, a button. What? No, no, no! no, no. Aw, oh, man, I wanted to push that button. Number 98, Denny's Death, Grey's Anatomy. And now, he, and now he's going to the more. Isn't that ridiculous? <laughs> Isn't that the most ridiculous piece of crap you've ever heard? There are no words to sum up the tragedy of Izzy and Denny, although there really isn't a need. Seeing Izzy hug her deceased love interest while still wearing a prom dress pretty much says it all. In a vacuum, it's one of television's most striking images. But as the culmination of a season-long love story that you couldn't help but root for, it cuts even deeper. Warm hands <laughs> and check it out. I have a regular heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. Denny's death and the heartbreaking aftermath reminded everyone that above all else, Grey's Anatomy still takes place in a hospital. People die and people grieve. Yeah, Izzy's not alone in this one. When Denny flatlines, it's hard not to cry right alongside her. I thought I was a surgeon, but I am not. So I quit. Izzy. Number 97, He's My Husband, Roseanne. Hey! Leave him alone. What's it to you? No one delivers a good old-fashioned one-liner quite like Dan Connor. That's plain to see in this Halloween episode, where Roseanne gets in hot water by choosing trick and cross-dressing in a bar. Thankfully, Dan's there to save the day, and it's treats all around. The bar ruffian asks a very simple question. Who is the bearded Roseanne to Dan? And, well, we'll just let the Connor patriarch answer for himself. He's my husband. <laughs> Dan's quick-witted reply is the perfect way to wrap up Roseanne's gut-busting scheme. But from a family as prone to hijinks as the Connors, we shouldn't even be surprised. Oh, here's a real man for ya. That beard kind of tickles. <laughs> bada boom, bada bing! 
Number 96, Annalise takes off her wig and makeup. How to get away with murder. Bonnie just told me you got the girl out on bail. Just tell me you didn't take out a second mortgage to pay for it. How to cover up a crime? No, this show should really be called Is There Anything Viola Davis Can't Do? That's a genuine question. Her turn as hardened law professor Annalise Keating always commanded respect, but courtroom fireworks are nothing compared to seeing her get ready for bed. When she takes off her wig and makeup, Annalise's veneer goes with them, revealing her inner vulnerability for the very first time. And of course, Davis acts the absolute hell out of it. Then, to really seal the deal, the whole thing ends with a jaw-dropping cliffhanger, too. What's not to love? Why is your penis on a dead girl's phone? Number 95, Jazz Time, Severance. <laughs> Awkward, propulsive, strange. This jivey dance number is everything all at the same time. And boy, is it crazy. There are multicolored lights, off-kilter choreography, and fist fights? Yeah, it gets intense. No one could have ever imagined that Severance would abandon office work for a five-minute jazz-inspired dance break. But that's also why it's easily the highlight of the season. Coming from a show like this, that is high praise. After all, Severance knows how to drop a plot twist. We're still not over the whole deal with Mark's wife. And yet nothing sums up the show's delightfully weird side better than this impromptu jazz number. The music dance experience is officially canceled. Number 94, Final Fusion, Steven Universe. The only thing that dazzles brighter than a crystal gem is four crystal gems. If that sounds like a lot, it's because it is. But in the midst of the high-stakes battle for the fate of everything, Stephen and his friends had no choice but to bring out the big gems. It just so happened to come in the form of an incredible four-way vision between Stephen, Pearl, Amethyst, and Garnet. Its name? Obsidian. The cathartic transformation towers above everything the series had done to that point, both figuratively and literally. They say bigger isn't always better, but in the case of this climactic fusion, we have to respectfully disagree. Oh, Starlight, what are you doing crawling in here? You want your legs back? You want your planet back? Surely you can understand why I can't let you leave? Look what you did to yourself last time. Number 93, Matthew proposes to Mary, Downton Abbey. Well then. I haven't forgiven you because I don't believe you need my forgiveness. Well, here it is, the grand romantic gesture to end all grand romantic gestures. Mary is about to head to America, thinking she's lost her chance, when Matthew decides to get down on one knee and pop a very long overdue question. Covered in a breathtaking flurry of snow, the whole moment feels like something out of a fairy tale. Did we mention it aired on Christmas Day? Lady Mary Crawley, will you do me the honor of becoming my wife? While Matthew and Mary have been at the center of some of the show's most legendary moments and tragedies, this one blissful proposal still ranks above them all. If their kiss didn't make you squeal with joy, you either haven't seen Downton Abbey or you're lying. Yes. <sighs> Number 92, The Justice League Assembles, Smallville. All right, let's do it. After six seasons carefully crafting Superman's origin story, Smallville saw your Kryptonian and raised you a whole entire Justice League. We're talking Aquaman, Cyborg, The Flash, and Green Arrow fighting together. At the time, 
Seeing all these iconic comic book characters side by side in live action was simply unprecedented, to say nothing of its impact on Smallville. You want more of your friends to end up in here? Yeah, I'm voting no on that one. This wasn't just a team up for fan service's sake. The show had earned it through years of fantastic world building and in-depth character work. It may not be on the big screen, but for our money, the Justice League has never looked cooler than they did in the first mission to Smallville. Number 91, the first Super Saiyan transformation, Dragon Ball Z. I must admit that spirit bomb of yours sure packs a wallop. Over the years, there have been a lot of last minute power ups and downright iconic transformations. But no matter the medium, they all share a debt to Goku and Frieza. Their fight on the exploding planet Namek is as legendary as it gets, mostly thanks to the debut of a certain Saiyan hairstyle. <laughs> To this day, Goku's roar has kids all over the world screaming their lungs out in hopes of growing their own golden locks. There's no way to quantify the impact Super Saiyan had on the future of anime. But even though it's been copied, ripped off, and iterated upon hundreds of times, there's just no topping the original in all its throat-shredding glory. Gohan, listen very carefully. You must leave this planet now and take Piccolo with you. Got it? <laughs> This is the last time I'm going to tell you! Get out of here right now, Gohan! Number 90. From Honeymooners to Hostages. The Honeymooners. What about the other copper that's waiting downstairs? What about him, huh? Getting held up at gunpoint is no laughing matter. Ralph and Alice have a tendency to find humor in things, though. And this high-stakes hostage situation is not any different. Ralph being Ralph tries to take charge of the situation with equal parts bluff and buffoonery. Oh, All right! I want your dick him up! <laughs> Just like his time on a TV game show, he knows how to fake it to hilarious heights. In this case, he achieves it by threatening the thugs with a water gun. It doesn't work, but it sure is fun to watch. Who is it? Hey, Tommy, have you got my water pistol in there? <laughs> you can practically see how much fun the actors are having, and that makes for an absolutely infectious sequence from start to finish. Number 89, Bounce House Mania, Malcolm in the Middle. You know, son, this is all part of growing up. You're just gonna have to get used to it. No, I don't. I can go back. Number 88, The Eds Break Reality, Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Go, Ed, please. I got you. How's he put on a hat? Are we rich yet, Double D? It's all become very complicated, Eddie. Number 87, Offred's first ceremony, The Handmaid's Tale. Good evening. Dear. Now let's get started. Number 86, Richie wants Fonzie at Christmas. Happy days. I accept your uh, invitation. everybody. Let's get back to popping the popcorn. Richie, throw some marshmallows, huh? Number 85, Password, The Odd Couple. I'll give the password first to Oscar, Madison, and Betty White, and as they look at it, we want you to see it at home. You don't need a secret code to decipher why this moment leaves everyone cackling. Tony Randall and Jack Klugman always bring their A-game to the titular Odd Couple, but this time, they're joined by Betty White and real-life password host Alan Ludden. Nine points, Millicent. Canary. <laughs> Bird. You got it! To sweeten the deal, it's all under the guise of a game show. Need we say more? Jokes are crammed into every single line and gesture. For example, the fact that the Greek playwright Aristophanes is a good clue for both Bird and Ridiculous. Even if the game ends with Felix being dragged off stage, the utter hilarity he brought still deserves its time in the spotlight. 
Aristophanes. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> <You got it. laughs> Number 84, Tina's Fender Bender, Bob's Burgers. Tina, for the love of God, turn away or stop. The brakes, Tina, on the left, you're about to hit that car. The brakes, hit the brakes. <laughs> oh, my God, it's bad. Number 83, I Want It That Way, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Tell me why it ain't nothing but a mistake. Now number five. I never want to hear you say. Woo! I want it that way. Number 82, The Death of Mark Green, ER. Number 81, Jack Goes Back Once and For All, Samurai Jack. Get back already! No! Number 80, Opie's Sacrifice, Sons of Anarchy. We decide our fate. <laughs> Outnumbered, imprisoned, and forced into an impossible choice, Harry Opie Winston still went out on his own terms. Jax was technically supposed to call the shots, but when he can't decide which of his friends to sacrifice, Opie makes it for him via a very satisfying headbutt. Am I choosing or you? Michael. No. <laughs> no, 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 no! From there, Opie gets a pipe, some last words, and one hell of a violent funeral service. It's a stomach-churning sight, especially since Jax and the others have no choice but to sit and watch their friend's final moments. And yet a bloody, no-holds-barred prison skirmish is exactly the way someone like Opie deserved to go out. I got this. Number 79, Sheldon and Amy win the Nobel Prize, The Big Bang Theory. And in the field of physics, Dr. Amy Farrah Fowler and Dr. Sheldon Cooper for their discovery of super asymmetry. <laughs> Number 78, Fred and Barney go bowling, the Flintstones. Do I see a split? Just keep your eye on the ball, Barney boy. <laughs> Number 77, fold in the cheese, Schitt's Creek. You just, here's what you do. Uh -huh. You just fold it in. Okay, I don't know how to fold broken cheese like that. And I don't know how to be any clearer. You take that thing that's in your hand, uh -huh. and you... If you say fold in one more time... It says fold it in! Number 76, schoolyard smackdown, Cobra Kai. Oh, it is on! Number 75, the FCC song, Family Guy. They will clean up all your talking in a manner such as this. They will make you take a tinkle when you want to take a piss. He may not quite represent those good old-fashioned family values, but Peter Griffin sure can carry a tune. In this case, his ballad is about the Federal Communications Commission's heavy-handed censorship. And of course, it's complete with a montage of extremely risque moments. Trust us, it is guaranteed to stay in your head for weeks. Take a tip, take a lesson. You'll never win by messing with the fellows at the freaking FCC. If only for its laugh out loud lyrics. It really shouldn't be surprising. Family Guy has plenty of legendary songs. Sometimes they're about the FCC. Sometimes it's surfing birds by the trashmen. And sometimes it's alternate universes that are really, really into pie. It's a wonderful day for pie. You can ask all the birds in the sky. Clearly, the FCC has nothing on the power of music. Mr. Griffin, that was terrific. Number 74, 45 Days, How I Met Your Mother. Look around, Ted. You're all alone. Kids, it's been almost 20 years since that cold April night in 2013. 
And I can safely tell you, if I could go back in time and relive that night, there's no way in hell I'd go to robots versus wrestlers. Number 73, Jack Kills the Drazens, 24. Number 72, Jesse and Becky's Wedding, Full House. I now present Mr. and Mrs. Katsopoulos. <laughs> Number 71, Nate buries Lisa, six feet under. <laughs> Number 70, The Red Room, Twin Peaks. I thought the news. That's the music he's going to. Come back in style. Unless you care about Dale's favorite gum, there's not a lot of answers to be found in Special Agent Cooper's dreamscape. But that didn't stop the fabled Red Room from becoming a staple of television history. The few precious moments we spend in Dale's head are layered with so much symbolism, theorists have spent literal decades trying to unpack it all. The garbled dialogue and lack of background music adds an unnerving off-kilter tone, too. Just in case it wasn't creepy enough. As if it wasn't glaringly obvious before, this masterful dream sequence proved that Twin Peaks is unlike anything that has or will ever air again. Number 69, The Apartment Hunt, Broad City. Why am I so turned on right now? Ew, Pam, this place is horrible. Let's just move on. Look, don't bully me, all right? I can't take it. I was cyberbullied within an inch of my life last night. Number 68, Al is the millionth customer, married with children. <laughs> oh, Al, listen to my heartbeat. Oh. <laughs> It's incredible, Peg. I can hear it from here. Number 67, Pickle Rick goes to therapy. Rick and Morty. Be impressed. I'm a pickle. I I'm just trying to figure out why you would do this. Why anyone would do this. The reason anyone would do this, if they could, which they can't, would be because they could, which they can't. Number 66, Bill and Frank's last dinner, The Last of Us. Take me to bed. Number 65, the Tulsa Race Riot, Watchmen. Justice today, trust in the law. Despite its heroic source material, this HBO miniseries doesn't begin with superheroes, mysteries, or a dramatic fight for survival. It doesn't even start with pure fiction at all. No, in a bold creative swing, Watchmen's depiction of the 1921 race riot is devastatingly real. <laughs> The historical context adds a soul-crushing emotional weight to every bomb and gunshot. The final product is not for the faint of heart by any means. It bears repeating, these are the opening minutes of the very first episode. Watchmen daringly refuses to pull its punches, and instead leaves a harrowing first impression that really needs to be experienced for itself. Are you coming true? We're gonna be right behind you. Number 64, Negan Says Hi, The Walking Dead. Pissing our pants yet? Number 63, Red Light, Green Light, Squid Game. Number 62, Therapeutic Role-Playing, 30 Rock. 
Hello, Tracy. Jack informed me of the talk you had earlier, and if you don't mind, I'd like to hop right in and start with some role play. Like my wife and I do? Cool. You be the maid. I want you to scream. Donnie he, you play the matador. Uh, no, Tracy. Number 61, The Jonad Files, Veep. Do you recall a document shared on the J Drive titled The Jonad Files? Uh, no, no, ma'am. No, that doesn't ring a bell. So it's not a word combining Jonah and Gonad? Not to I my can knowledge. confirm that that is exactly what it is, and Mr. Egan knows that. Okay. Number 60, Kevin and Nora's hotel fight, The Leftovers. What happened to your head? You smoking? Yeah, you want one? Don't let the name fool you. This show is a full course of TV greatness, and all of its best qualities can be found in this one argument. Inside a claustrophobic hotel room, Kevin and Nora finally bear it all. The music builds, the insults get meaner, and smoke rises from a book burning in the sink. We never have to talk about it again, because that's what we do. We don't talk about anything. What do you want to talk about? But most importantly, all of Kevin and Nora's sordid history is finally spilled out in the form of a single gut-wrenching back and forth. It's the kind of drama that can only be achieved by a show with years of storytelling history under its belt. Now, can someone please explain how the show never won an Emmy? You were relieved, just say it. And now you want a new baby, are you insane? Or are you afraid you're gonna give that one away too? Number 59, The Panthers Win State, Friday Night Lights. Number 58, Cartman's Revenge on Scott Tennerman, South Park. Do you like it? Do you like it, Scott? I call it Mr. and Mrs. Tennerman Chili. Oh my God! Number 57, The Sky is Falling, The Golden Girls. You better beware, the message is clear. The message is fine, the prospect galling. It's run for your life, the sky. Number 56, Homelander and Maeve Abandon the Plane, The Boys. <laughs> Number 55, I Love You, Fleabag. It takes strength to know what's right. And love isn't something that weak people do. Few shows balance humor and tragedy as effortlessly as Phoebe Waller-Bridge's magnum opus. For every laugh elicited by Claire's horrific haircut, there were a few tears shed too. Most notably when Fleabag and the priest say their farewells at the bus station. It's a lovely moment and all, but it really should have come prepackaged with a box of tissues. I love you. It'll pass. Then, when Fleabag literally looks at the camera as if telling the audience we can't go with her either, chills all over. In a way, it's only right that Fleabag ended how it lived. Funny, honest, wise, and utterly impossible to forget. We love you too, Fleabag. It wasn't very hard. I spent all this time trying to figure out Wow. Number 54, Marsha's Nose, The Brady Bunch. 15, 64, 50, 80, 90, hey, hey! Hey, you guys. <gasps> oh, my nose! Marsha, stop. You okay? Number 53, Showing Van Gogh His Impact, Doctor Who. Number 52, Bojack eulogizes his mother, Bojack Horseman. Like, how hard is it to do something nice for a person? This woman at the Jack in the Box didn't even know me. I'm your son. All I had was you. 
Number 51, Eleven's Farewell, Stranger Things. Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! Number 50, Bruce Wayne vs. Batman, Batman the Animated Series. You're not well, Mr. Wayne. You need professional help. Liar! You know what's going on. This is a dream, and you're the one responsible. He is darkness. He is the night. He is Bruce Wayne? Trapped in a dream world, Bruce is faced with a reality where his parents never died and he never put on the cowl. But when another Batman starts wreaking havoc, the billionaire playboy has to decide whether his crusade is worth his happiness. The ensuing fight encompasses the reason Batman the Animated Series is such a beloved classic. It got dark. After all, what other franchise could have gotten away with nearly killing Batgirl? Whether in comics, animation, live action, or beyond, seeing Bruce Wayne literally fend off his own darkness is one of the coolest Batman moments of all time. What if you're wrong? Then I'll see you in your nightmares! Number 49, The Origins of the Bent Neck Lady, The Haunting of Hill House. Nellie. Number 48, Get On Your Feet, Parks and Recreation. Everybody smile away, smile away. Number 47, Mod's Abortion, Mod. Walter, I've decided to have the baby. I knew it. I told Arthur that would be your decision. I'm glad you're happy about it. You'll love being a father. Of course, Maud. Jen. Number 46, Damn You, You Traitors, Attack on Titan. <laughs> Number 45, Picard fights for android rights. Star Trek The Next Generation. Your Honor, we'll stipulate to all of this. Objection, Your Honor. I want this read. All of it. Believe it or not, one of sci-fi's most impactful moments takes place in a courtroom. There, Captain Picard valiantly argues for the rights of his robotic lieutenant Data. The conflict brings up a whole slew of questions about what defines sentience and humanity and Picard answers each one in a way that's powerful without ever becoming preachy. Commander Riker has dramatically demonstrated to this court that Lieutenant Commander Data is a machine. Do we deny that? No, because it is not relevant. We two are machines, just machines of a different type. Better yet, the next generation doesn't shy away from the timeless parallels of Data's plight. If anything, the themes of self-autonomy feel more relevant today than they did when the episode first aired in 1989. Star Trek boldly went where few shows had gone before, and it's all the better for it. Is it not true that had you refused to prosecute, Captain Lavoie would have ruled summarily against me? Yes. That action injured you and saved me. I will not forget it. Number 44, Moriarty reveals it all. Sherlock. No one ever gets to me. And no one ever will. I did. You've come the closest. Now you're in my way. Thank you. Number 43, Ben's dead. Scrubs. But in the end, the most important thing to accept is that no matter how alone you feel, how painful it may be, but I don't have to make this mistake. with the help of those around you, and I don't have to You'll get through this too. This way. If only I would wait. Number 42, Steamy Nights at the Ski Lodge, Fraser. I've had enough embarrassment for one night. <laughs> Dr. Craig! Daphne! Fraser! I'm sorry, wrong room! Number 41, Richard Kimball clears his name, The Fugitive. Tuesday. September 5th, the day the running stopped. Number 42, 
Number 40, Teddy Perkins' death, Atlanta. Benny, you're alive. For a show often labeled as a comedy, the episode Teddy Perkins has more in common with a horror film than a weekly sitcom. Its final moments prove as much. After Darius is lured into a mansion by the twisted Teddy Perkins, who is played by series star, writer, and creator Donald Glover, by the way, things get messy fast. Whoa, 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 wait, wait. A gun comes out, and then another, and by the time it's all said and done, Darius is standing in front of two dead bodies. There's no punchline. Rather, Atlanta bravely sheds its comedic instincts to deliver one of the most impactful finales in what is already one of television's best shows. Shit. Number 39, Jailbreak, Andor. No! What's going on out there? Go, go! Oh, hey, 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 hey. Number 38, Buffy finds her mother's body, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. She's in here. I'm getting no pulse. Let's lay her out. Number 37, liberating the concentration camp, Band of Brothers. Open it up, sir. Stand back. Give us some room here. Stand back. 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 Number 36. Mary demands equal pay. The Mary Tyler Moore Show. Mary, Gordy, yeah. would you say that I'm doing, a, you know, as, as good a job as the guy who was the associate producer before me? Better. Oh, much better. Number 35. Mr. Hooper's death. Sesame Street. And last but not least, ta da! Oh, oh look at that one. That's, that's nice. So beautiful. That's so nice. That is real. No recast, hand wave, or drive into the sunset would ever live up to the legacy Will Lee's Mr. Hooper left behind. The actor's passing in 1982 was felt for years to come. However, in the 80s, a children's show acknowledging the realities of death was nigh unthinkable but Sesame Street took that as a challenge. A big bird? Mm -hmm. he's, he, he's, he's not in there. Oh, then where is he? Big bird, uh, don't you remember we told you? Uh, Mr. Hooper died. Unflinchingly delving into Big Bird's grief, the show carefully explained why and how people die. Kid or adult, it's a powerful watch, especially knowing this is Sesame Street's goodbye to Lee, too. Whenever this scene comes on, you can bet there is not a dry eye left, not on Sesame Street or at home. He's never coming back? Never? No. Well, I don't understand. You know, everything was just fine. Why does it have to be this way? Give me one good reason. Number 34, The Bubble Bowl, SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> Number 33, Ellen Comes Out, Ellen. Susan, I'm gay. <laughs> Number 32, Barry versus Ronnie and Lily. Barry. I thought you were a dog. Get off me! Get off me! Get off me! Number 31, America is not the greatest country in the world. The newsroom. There is absolutely no evidence to support the statement that we're the greatest country in the world. We're seventh in literacy, 27th in math, 22nd in science, 49th in life expectancy, 178th in infant mortality, third in median household income, number four in labor force, and number four in exports. We lead the world in only three categories. Number of incarcerated citizens per capita, number of adults who believe angels are real, and defense spending. Number 30, Mulder meets Scully, The X-Files. 
Most shows don't have their most iconic moments in their first episode, but in the case of The X-Files, there is one scene that is particularly memorable. Are you familiar with the so-called X-Files? I believe they have to do with unexplained phenomena. More or less. The reason you're here, Agent Scully, is we want you to assist Mulder on these X-Files. Dana Scully and Fox Mulder are household names now after having been in the pop culture zeitgeist for most of the 90s, and the scene in which they meet is classic. They are FBI agents with very different traits, and when they meet for the first time, the stage is set for what their relationship would look like throughout the show. Agent Mulder, I'm Dana Scully. I've been assigned to work with you. Oh, isn't it nice to be suddenly so highly regarded? So who did you take off to get stuck with this detail, Scully? Mulder is entertained by Scully's new role trying to debunk his cases, and while it's clear that they are total opposites, we know in that moment they have real lasting chemistry. Number 29. Dexter discovers Rita's body. Dexter. <laughs> Number 28. Squabble of the Survivors. Curb your enthusiasm. Where's this survivor? What? He, he's the survivor. From the, from the television show. Survivor. I was over in Australia. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of Seinfeld. <laughs> he really is. Yeah. <laughs> How is Jerry? Number 27. Crashing the Brazado Thanksgiving dinner. The bear. Michael, hey, Mike. I need you to calm down, buddy. All right? There's other people at the table. I need you to calm down. You're being a bit of an asshole. Thank you, Uncle Jay. I'm fine. That is the familial support I was looking Bill, for. Bill, you're being a f asshole, too. Number 26. A lesson on teaching lessons. Arrested development. This is a lesson, and maybe I pushed you into this, but I love you too much to see you ruin your life with that crap. But, but it wasn't for me. Then who is it for? Who? Give me a name. Okay, it was for me. Number 25, President Bartlett's anger and anguish, The West Wing. With Aaron Sorkin at the helm and Martin Sheen taking the stage, we know we're seeing something great. But something about this scene in particular stands out from even the rest of the show. In the season two finale, President Bartlett is facing several dark moments in his life, from the death of his personal secretary to dealing with the ramifications surrounding a political scandal. I don't know what to say. Leo's pretty rich. Maybe you can buy some tech stocks and jack up the price. After attending his secretary's funeral, he lets out his anger towards God. Speaking in both English and Latin, he impassionately demands explanations for everything that's happened to him. Yes, I lied. It was a sin. I've committed many sins. Have I displeased you, you feckless thug? 3.8 million new jobs, that wasn't good. In this scene, the President of the United States becomes one of the most relatable characters on television, and that in itself is truly powerful. Number 24, Troy gets the pizza, Community. Number 23, Prison Escape, Daredevil. <laughs> Number 22, Pepe Silvia, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. And I knock on her door and I say, Carol! Carol, I gotta talk to you about Pepe! Goddamn desk in that office, there is no Carol in HR. Number 21, who shot JR? Dallas. Who's there? <laughs> Number 20, tracking shot, true detective. It didn't take long for the series to find its footing, as one of the most incredible scenes came just four episodes into the first season. The entire scene is six minutes long and is done in one take, tracking detectives Cole and Papa Nia as they go undercover in a gang's compound. You know where the stash house is? Tiger's gonna take us there. You 
got an exit plan? When a shootout ensues, it foils their infiltration and nearly takes their lives. With the scene not having any cuts, we can feel the intensity, giving us the illusion of being right there alongside the detectives in real time. It's a masterclass in technical filmmaking, and we are not surprised that director Kerry Joji Fukunaga won Outstanding Director for a Drama Series at the Emmys for this episode. Go, go, go! Number 19, Socks and Shoes, All in the Family. Archie and his son-in-law Michael, better known as Meathead, famously never see eye to eye throughout All in the Family. One of the best scenes with them is when Archie hilariously shows Michael how to put on socks and his shoes. Suppose there's a fire in the house and you gotta run for your life. Your way, all you got on is one shoe and a sock. My way, you got on a sock and a sock. You see, you're even. He teaches him how to put them on properly, and even though Archie is blunt and crass in his delivery, it really is a father-son moment that has us both in stitches and our feels. Another memorable moment happens in a much later season when Gloria and Mike say goodbye to Edith and Archie. I know you always thought I hated you. Oh, shh. But I love you. But this show is a comedy at its core, so the funnier moment shared between the two has to take the cake. Number 18, the carousel pitch, Mad Men. Don Draper is one of the most iconic TV characters in recent history, and his client pitches and advertising prowess deliver numerous seriously memorable moments throughout the show. This is the greatest advertising opportunity since the invention of cereal. From the cigarette pitch in the pilot to the epiphany of the Coca-Cola ad in the finale, he always impresses us. His most impressive moment of all, though, is in the finale of the first season. When pitching to Kodak, Don taps into his rarely seen sentimental side, showing his client the carousel projector with pictures of his family. This device isn't a spaceship. It's a time machine. This brings out the emotions of everyone in the room, and all of us sitting at home in our living rooms, too. How does he do it? Number 17, Chandler and Monica come clean, Friends. Picking just one amazing scene from Friends is not easy, but neither is combining hilarious with heartfelt, which the friends do seamlessly in this scene. Oh look, there's, there's Monica and Chandler, hey! Hey you guys, hey! <laughs> Monica and Chandler keep their romance a secret from the rest of the group for a long time, and when they all find out, schemes are put in motion. Phoebe hits on Chandler to try to get him to admit what's going on, with Rachel, Joey, and Monica all in on it since they know that they know, you know? Nervous? Me? No. You? No. I want this to happen. <laughs> so do I. The moments shared between Chandler and Phoebe are hysterical, and Chandler admitting his love for Monica to his friends is beautiful. Their proposal is a beautiful moment too, but you just can't beat this one. Number 16, Chuck's Meltdown, Better Call Saul. This entire third season episode involves tense and explosive moments between Jimmy and his older brother Chuck. Look, if you won't tell her, then I will. You will? No, no, you will not tell her. Jimmy is able to really show how manipulative he is as a lawyer and how no one is off the table when it comes to winning a case, including using vulnerabilities only he would know about his brother to expose him on the witness stand. Chuck claims to have sensitivity to electromagnetic fields until Jimmy reveals the contrary in the courtroom, and Chuck loses it. And he gets to be a lawyer? What a sick joke! I should have stopped him when I had the chance! It's a great performance by both actors in a moment that shocks everyone and reminds us, just as with Breaking Bad, that Vince Gilligan can basically do no wrong. Number 15, Dinner Party Meltdown, The Office. The Office is chock full of episodes and scenes that fans everywhere will probably never forget. While it's hard to pick just one, the dinner party episode is particularly memorable. Michael has asked Pam and me to dinner at least nine times, and every time we've been able to get out of it. But I gotta give him credit. He got me. Because I'm starting to suspect that there was no assignment from corporate. When Jan and Michael host Pam, Jim, Angela, and Andy, they get a few unexpected guests in the form of Dwight and his babysitter. Between Jan's singing, Michael's neon signs, and a plethora of other awkward instances, the night is full of cringeworthy moments. 
everything culminates in a blow-up between Jan and Michael that is both very funny and very uncomfortable. Man, I would love to burn your candles. You burn it, you buy it. Oh, good. I'll be your first customer. But you're hardly my first. Their fight involves the TV getting smashed and the cops getting called. And this scene perfectly encompasses Jan and Michael's relationship, Michael's personality, and the essence of the entire show. Number 14. Avon and Stringer on the Roof – The Wire In the third season of The Wire, Avon and Stringer's relationship reaches a tumultuous peak as they disagree on how to handle their illicit business. I mean, if I had taken care of that earlier, man. It's always gonna be a Marlow, man. No Marlo, no game. But you could have dealt with that shit a little sooner, I mean, yeah, but you know what I'm saying, don't let it lay on you like that. Stringer betrays Avon, and it's clear that Stringer's decision will lead to their relationship's demise. While they're on different pages, they spend their final conversation reminiscing about their time together in their youth. The talk ends with them realizing that they can't trust each other, and that moving forward, things will be different. Dust, man. The nuances weaved throughout the discussion are powerful, as they talk about where they've been and where they are now. While Omar's testimony was also a significant moment on the show, this subtle exchange just couldn't be beat. Number 13. Will's Father Leaves – The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air This series has plenty of moments that left us rolling in the aisles, but it's a scene that left us in tears that makes this list. When Will's father Lou tries to reconcile with him after years of being absent, his intentions seem good, but everyone's guard is up. That is not cool, man, the way you dissing my father like that. The hell with your father! Philip, for God's he sake! He waltzes in here after 15 years? 14. Oh, oh, excuse me, 14 years! And acts like nothing has happened! Wake up, Will! Lou plans to take a trip with Will, but bails when work opportunities come up, which is a thin excuse at best. When Lou leaves, Will realizes that his dad is walking out of his life yet again. Although he starts out playing it cool, the moment when he breaks down in Uncle Phil's arms will always be one of the saddest moments in sitcom history. How come you don't want me, man? <laughs> Number 12. Kendall's Press Conference – Succession the dynamic between Logan and Kendall is one of the most intricate and complicated relationships on the show. And in this scene, Kendall tries to establish where he stands with his father. It's okay, Shiv. It's okay. It had to be done. Up until this point, Logan has always been one step ahead of Kendall, or he was able to use his power to keep him in line. When the scandal surrounding the Waystar Royco cruise lines comes to light, it appears as though Kendall is going to publicly take the fall. However, in a twist no one really saw coming, he throws Logan under the bus. My father keeps a watchful eye over every inch of his whole empire, and the notion that he would have allowed millions of dollars in settlements and compensation to be paid without his explicit approval is utterly fanciful. It's a turning point in the series, it left viewers speechless, and it's one of the greatest moments on television in recent history. Number 11. Frank Grimes Loses It – The Simpsons I've never seen him do any work around here. I mean, what, what is his job? Safety inspector. That irresponsible oaf? For all intents and purposes, Frank Grimes is an average guy. Hardworking, diligent, and eager to learn. Basically, he's the anti-Homer. So understandably, he is a bit peeved to learn that characters in The Simpsons tend to fail upwards. It all comes to a boiling point in the iconic final act, where Grimes goes absolutely ballistic. I don't need to do my work, cause someone else will do it for me! Do, do, do! Hey, you okay, Grimey? I'm better than okay. I'm Homer Simpson. Unfortunately, his attempts at mimicking Homer only succeed in putting him in an early grave. While the residents of Springfield try to play it off as a joke, there is an unshakable dark irony to Grimes' role in the story. His only crime was being normal, and in The Simpsons, that made him the craziest of all. I am sure he's looking down on him right now. Getting him. Change the channel, Marge! <laughs> <laughs> That's our homer! Number 10. Robert Sees the Gremlin – The Twilight Zone Although this moment might seem borderline laughable when viewed through 21st century eyes, it was a beyond terrifying scene in the early 60s. In this episode, William Shatner's character sees a gremlin on the wing of an airplane. <laughs> K 
considering that his character has recently suffered a nervous breakdown and no one else on the plane can see the gremlin, it's a Hamlet-esque scene that leaves us wondering if he's gone crazy. The entire episode is strung together by a terrific performance by Shatner, who eventually goes to great lengths to get rid of the gremlin. <laughs> But it's the scene in which he first spots the scary creature that has stuck with viewers decades later. Number 9. Sorry, we're closed. Cheers. Cheers gave us many laughs and tears throughout its 11-season run. The dynamic between the characters is always fun to watch, and we've always known that this group of patrons was more like family than friends. Oh, and I just want to tell you that um, the days that I had here at Cheers were the, they were the best days of my life. Really? You. <laughs> what, what are you saying? You're not going to come back and see us anymore? No, I will every now and then, you know. In the final scene of the final episode, Sam Malone acknowledges how important the bar is to him, has a surprisingly poignant conversation with Norm, and turns a customer away as he closes for the night. Sorry, we're closed. It's a simple scene that sums up the atmosphere of the sitcom perfectly. And who doesn't shed a tear when Sam proclaims that he is the luckiest SOB alive? Number 8. Avatar Aang vs. Fire Lord Ozai – Avatar The Last Airbender No, I'm not gonna end it like this. Even with all the power in the world, you are still weak. Water, earth, fire, air. As the master of all four elements, it was always Aang's destiny to fight Fire Lord Ozai and end the Hundred Year War. And yes, the show totally delivered. With Sozin's comet in the background and Aang in all his Avatar State glory, this long-awaited showdown is a tour de force of storytelling. But it's not just action for action's sake. No, Avatar knows how to tug on the heartstrings. Just look at Iroh's weep-inducing tribute to his son, itself a memorial to the General's late original actor. So, with its emotional core firmly intact, Aang choosing mercy over violence feels like the only way Avatar could have ended. Number 7. The Sea Was Angry That Day, My Friends Seinfeld. This iconic sitcom is known for being endlessly quotable, with moments that have impacted pop culture years after its final episode aired. From the soup Nazi to the parking garage to the contest, there are almost too many choices to pick from, but George's daunting tale of saving a whale is one we will not soon forget. What's going on over here? There's a beached whale. She's dying. Is anyone here a marine biologist? After lying about being a marine biologist, George is forced to pull an obstruction from the fish, mammal's blowhole. George's animated storytelling is already incredible, but when the golf ball is introduced to the story, it takes the hilarity to the next level. George as marine biologist is truly the ultimate fake it till you make it. I knew something was there. So I reached my hand in, felt around and pulled out the obstruction. <laughs> Number 6. Desmond and Penny's Phone Call – Lost the episode in which we see the infamous call between Desmond and Penny is certainly one of the more memorable and emotional ones in the series. I know this doesn't make any sense because it doesn't make any sense to me, but eight years from now, I, I need to call you and I can't call you if I don't have your number. What? Needless to say, the scene shared between them is tragically beautiful. Desmond is experiencing intense flashbacks and forwards while being unable to anchor himself at any point in time. No matter where he is, he's trying to find Penny. And when he finally does, we are as desperate for him to stay in contact with her as he is. Oh my god, Penny, is that really you? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's me. You believe me? <laughs> you still care about me? It's lost at its most emotional, and we are practically holding our breath through their entire call. Number 5. The Red Wedding – Game of Thrones This landmark series offers shocking moment after shocking moment, so to have one stand out to this extent is remarkable. During 
Edmure Tully and Rosalind Frey's wedding feast, Rob and Talisa Stark are shockingly and brutally murdered by the Freys, along with the Bannermen, and Catelyn Stark also falls victim to this betrayal. It's one of the most unexpected TV moments ever, and viewers were absolutely beside themselves after seeing this scene. The Lannisters send their regards. The significance of the scene also cannot be overstated, as this signifies a switch in power dynamics, and the fallout would be felt for many seasons to follow. Number 4. Hank's Death, Breaking Bad Speaking of shows with endlessly shocking moments, particularly surrounding characters' deaths, we would be quite remiss if we didn't include this one. While Gustavo Fring's face-off death at the hands of Hector is mind-blowing, the complexities surrounding Hank's death are definitely noteworthy. <sighs> ah. Oh, simmer down there, Sparky. Hank spends most of the series tracking down Heisenberg, and chaos ensues when he realizes he's actually been searching for his brother-in-law the whole time. Hank tries to take him down, which instead leads to this scene where Hank is killed by Jack even after Walt offers him millions not to, and the death is ultimately a catalyst for Walt's downfall. You want me to beg? You're the smartest guy I ever met, and you're too stupid to see. He made up his mind ten minutes ago. Did we mention that this episode has a whopping 10 on 10 on IMDb? Iconic. Number 3. Candy Factory – I Love Lucy We couldn't talk about the greatest TV scenes of all time without talking about the OG sitcom queen Lucille Ball. In her role as Lucy Ricardo, she broke barriers on the small screen and always left us with a laugh. Gee, I'm glad you're home. How's about a great big… I'll see you later. <laughs> Come in. What's the matter? This scene encompasses her character perfectly. The irrepressible Lucy enlists her best friend Ethel to work with her at a candy factory while their husbands tackle the housework. But at the conveyor belt, the women simply can't keep up with the very fast-paced work and end up resorting to tossing chocolate into their mouths to avoid messing up. It is a testament to Lucille Ball's impeccable physical comedy and a groundbreakingly funny scene. Number 2. The Diner – The Sopranos This legendary show is widely regarded as one of, if not the, greatest TV series of all time, and its finale has become particularly iconic. What looks good tonight? Mm. I don't know. Just as we felt throughout most of the episode, the final scene is filled with tension and uncertainty as Tony sits alone in the diner, observing people coming in and out of the restaurant. Although he's waiting for his family, who eventually start arriving one by one, you're never sure who's gonna show up or what might happen next. Set to the soundtrack of Journey's Don't Stop Believin', we hear the bell ring from the door opening before it all cuts to black. It's genius, it's maddening, it's The Sopranos. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Goodbye, MASH This show may be a comedy drama, but its most famous scenes are definitely not comical. One of the most shocking moments came in the finale episode of the third season, when Colonel Henry Blake's plane is shot down. Lieutenant Colonel Henry Blake's plane was shot down over the Sea of Japan. But nothing beats the record-breaking finale. As the Korean War comes to a close, Hawkeye's revelation leads to a breakdown that leads him to confront his demons before he returns home. Watching all of the characters saying goodbye to one another, and ultimately us, is gut-wrenching. Maybe you're right, maybe we will see each other again, but just in case we don't, I want you to know how much you've meant to me. When Hawkeye says farewell and boards the helicopter, seeing the word goodbye written out in rocks, there wasn't a dry eye among 125 million viewers. Hard to beat a moment like that. What's a controversial TV moment you're willing to go to bat for? Don't be shy! Let us know in the comments below! Did you enjoy this video? 
check out these other clips from WatchMojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.